Hello, Plymouth Church and friends. Welcome to the worship of God right here on this second weekend of Eastertide. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here, right here under the loving arms of God. Here's a little sneak peek at what's going on at Plymouth that you'll no doubt want to be a part of. And I know you'll want to be a part of our outdoor worship services on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. on the upper level of the parking deck. Bring your camping chairs and the whole family to enjoy some creative worship opportunities in the cool spring air. Just a reminder, masks are required at all times and registration is encouraged, though not required. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Do you love a good book? Well, you're in luck because we have two opportunities to join a book study at Plymouth. Pastor Leanne and Stephen Minister Brian LaCrone are hosting a six-week study on the Universal Christ by Richard Rohr. This will begin on Sunday, April 18th at 4 p.m. Contact Brian LaCrone via email with any questions, and there's a registration link in your Plymouth Weekly. Another book study is with me, Pastor Rushing. I will be hosting a four-week young adult book study on friendships using the book, The Art of Showing Up, How to Be There for Yourself and Your People. Contact me via email if you're interested. It's finally spring and Earth Day is approaching. So it's a great time to celebrate with your family pets at Plymouth. We will have our annual pet blessing on Saturday, April 17th at 2 p.m. on the upper level of the parking deck. Bring your family, your pets, your neighbors, and their pets too for a blessing of the animals. And we have yard signs for your yard. Let your neighbors and passersby know where you attend church with a practice radical love yard sign. Come by the church, the lower level of the parking deck, and pick one up on Sunday, April 11th from 1 to 3 p.m. Okay, Plymouth Church, we're going to need your help for these last two announcements. We want to hear from you. This Eastertide, Plymouth is exploring joy made complete, and we want to hear your joy-filled stories. So from the silly stories when you laugh so hard your stomach hurt to the challenges that have taught you to savor joy, we want to hear your stories. Second, this summer we are celebrating a faith in which we are invited to talk to God about our joys, our fears, our doubts, our anger, and all of our questions. In fact, we would like to use your questions to organize the summer sermon series titled Living the Questions. We are inviting you to share with us your questions for God, your questions about faith, where you struggle with doubt, questions you have about being part of the Plymouth community. Please prayerfully and faithfully offer your questions by April 26th. All of these current happenings and more are ways we can experience joy made complete. And we even have an online guide. On the Plymouth Church website, right on the homepage, you'll find a link to the wonderful toolkit filled with events and activities for this Easter season. Go check it out. As always, we praise God from whom all blessings flow, and we thank God for all the gifts that we have been given. Your stewardship allows for your congregation to be in ministry with the community and to be a place of love and acceptance for so many people. I invite you, as a form of worship, to prayerfully consider the ways in which you can be engaged in Christian stewardship at Plymouth. And if you are struggling to make ends meet, we do have some means to help. Please reach out to us if you are in need of assistance. For more information on all of Plymouth's weekly events and offerings, from event registration, joy-filled stories, your intriguing sermon questions for this summer, book studies, and more, I encourage you to check out the church website or find the Plymouth Weekly email in your inbox. All of these current happenings and more are ways we can experience joy made complete. 
And that's a wrap. Over to you, Pastor Mary Kate, for our call to worship. We gather to worship the one who crafted creation out of chaos. Our cries of joy join the anthems of the universe. We gather to lift our praise to the God who gives us voice. Our songs join the concerto of creation. We gather as the children of God, our joy unbroken in God's love. Let us worship God. <laughs>
Let us pray together our opening prayer. God of life, for the memories of joy that live within us, we thank you. For the unexpected joys that fill our souls, we thank you. For the opportunity to be makers, carriers, and creators of joy, we thank you. May the joy that comes from you touch our hearts, stir our minds, and enliven our souls this day. We pray in the name of the risen Christ and in the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, Christ is risen. God's love is on the move. Not confined to place or time, but all around us, including within us. Thanks be to God. Amen. So last weekend, we kicked off the Eastertide season with a joyful theme, Joy Made Complete. During this season, you have the opportunity to share stories, words, and expressions of joy in many different ways. Today in worship, we are reminded that every story is a God story. So let's listen to this God story from Craig Shives. It's about 8 o'clock on an early June morning when the temperature is still cool and inviting. The sun is shining in a bright blue sky and the surface of the lake is smooth as glass. When my paddle takes its first bite into the water, the kayak silently glides across the surface. A Canada goose on the far shore honks its greeting or perhaps a warning to stay away from its territory. It was pure joy. From nearly as far back as I can remember, I have wanted to build a boat. Initially, I envisioned a small hydroplane with an outboard motor. It never happened. The dream only started to become a reality in the fall of 2017 when Kathy and I visited Port Townsend in the San Juan Islands. Port Townsend was the home of Pygmy Boats, a company offering kits to build wooden kayaks. We visited the showroom where all the kayak models were on display. I was like a kid in a candy store. After studying several models, I selected one to try in the water. It was like driving a little sports car, so light and so quick and responsive, I was hooked. But more than a little concerned about whether I could successfully build one myself. After mulling the idea through the winter, I took the plunge in April and ordered a kit to build in my basement storeroom. Before ordering, I did carefully measure to be sure that once built, I could get the kayak out of the workroom. I did not want to end up with a permanent display model in the lower level of our home. There were several moments of joy as I watched the kit grow from 28 thin flat wood pieces into a keel, then a hull, then a deck and a cockpit, all to be covered in fiberglass and three coats of marine spar varnish. Virtually every day for three months, I had the pleasure of completing the project step by step. The launching of the kayak on Lake Aquabi was made all the more special as it included Kathy and our daughter Sarah, who happened to be visiting at the time. It was a joyous occasion for many reasons. The kayak didn't leak. It paddled straight and true. And the experience was shared with two of the most important and well-loved people in my life. Since then, I have spent many pleasant days exploring the waters of Chichaqua Bottoms, Big Creek, Blue Heron Lake, Moffat Reservoir, Grays Lake, and Bay Lake in Minnesota. Occasionally, when I have the kayak out, someone will remark, wow, that's really neat. Did you build it? It is with a certain amount of joy that I answer, yep, I did. A simple kayak. Joy in the planning. Joy in the building. Joy in the paddling. 
Joy in marveling at how it all came together. Joy made complete. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything we've got in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never feel discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Find a friend so faithful Who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness Take it to the Lord in prayer Still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Oh, do your friends despise, forsake you, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield you, you will find your solace there in his arms. In his arms he'll take and shield you, you will find a solace. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, hey! Hey, Plymouth kids! Do you know what I'm doing? I'm making a joyful noise to God. Let's sit down and talk about it. So I was reading the Bible this morning, and it talked about the whole universe making a joyful noise to God. And it got me thinking, the whole universe is a lot of stuff. I feel like I'm pretty good at making a joyful noise to God. But what about all the rest of the universe? Like all the rest of the stuff on earth. Like the stones and the sky and the grass and the water and the frogs. How do they make a joyful noise to God? Let's think. A lot of you have dogs at home, right? Well, what do they do when they're full of joy? Do they wag, wag, wag? Or maybe they bark, bark, bark. Or my dog, when she gets the zoomies and she's so full of joy, she run, 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 runs as fast as she can. How does a frog make a joyful noise? Just imagine a cute little frog by the side of the pond, the sun beating down on it. Ribbit, ribbit, plop. The joyful noise of a frog. Now what about the grass? I think the most joyful noise of the grass is when the wind and the grass join together 
to make a joyful noise. Together, the wind joins the grass, and it makes a beautiful, joyful noise. Swish, swish, swish. These are amazing, joyful noises, right? Now just imagine how full of joy God is when the whole universe joins together in joyful noise. That's worship of God, right? We are going to be making some joyful noise over the next few weeks, so we should probably practice together, right? Let's stand up and we'll make a joyful noise together. Ribbit, bark, zoom, lag, plop, swish, alleluia! In the sacrament of holy baptism, our gracious God liberates us from sin and the power of death. In the waters of baptism, we are reborn children of God and inheritors of abundant and eternal life. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, which is the body of Christ. As we live with Christ and with God's people, we grow in faith and in love of God and our neighbor. Madeline and Jordan, will you name your child and present him to the church for baptism? We, we present, present Arthur, Arthur Earl, Earl Jameson. Jameson. In Christian love, you have presented this child for baptism. You should therefore faithfully bring him to the services of God's house and teach him the Lord's Prayer. As he grows in years, you should place in his hands the Holy Scriptures and provide for his instruction in the Christian faith that living in the covenant of his baptism and in communion with the church, he may live his life as a follower of the way of Jesus. Will you fulfill these duties? We will, we will. and we ask God to help us. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks. For in the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters and you created heaven and earth. By the gift of water, you nourish and sustain us in all living things. We remember that you led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the waters of the sea, out of slavery into the freedom of new life. We remember that in the waters of the Jordan River, Jesus was baptized and anointed by the Holy Spirit. We remember that it was living water that Jesus offered to the woman at the Samaritan well. Pour out your Holy Spirit so that Arthur Earl, who is here baptized, may be washed in your new life, your freedom, your love. Amen. Arthur Earl Jameson, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Arthur Earl, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. God, pour upon you the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of love and joy forever. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works, and give glory to God in heaven. Let us pray. O oh God, giver of all life, look with kindness upon Madeline and Jordan. Let them ever rejoice in the gift of their child. Make them teachers and examples of goodness and care. May their home be a place of love and delight in listening and sharing, as they and their child learn and grow into the people you have created them to be. Amen. People of Plymouth, we welcome Arthur into our life together. Alleluia and amen.
Thanksgiving for God's goodness. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministries that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let us pray together. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We are going to start this morning with a story from a book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. 
This is actually a management book that was written a few years ago by Gordon McKenzie about his experiences, I think, with Hallmark. And I want to promise you, you'll see what this means in a moment, that no chickens were harmed in the production of this sermon. So, Gordon's father spent the summer of 1904, so a long time ago, on the farm of an aunt and uncle who lived in Ontario, Canada. And they had a son who was the same age as Gordon's father, about 10. And the family story was that when these two boys got together, they had a genius for mischief. So one Sunday, the boys decided that they had stomach aches so they wouldn't be able to go to church. Now, this is something I am sure that none of you and none of your children have ever done. But they did it, and they convinced the aunt and uncle that they were, in fact, sick. So the aunt and uncle got in their carriage and went into town to go to church without the boys. Guess what happened? It was a miracle. The boys were cured, and they started looking for something to do. So the country cousin asked Gordon's father, do you know how to mesmerize a chicken? Mesmerize? No, what's that, said Gordon's father. So the country cousin led the way to the hen house behind the farm, and he selected a fine white hen. He carried her under his arm to the front of the house, and he produced a piece of chalk from his pocket, and he drew a short white line on the front porch, on the floor, and then he stood the chicken over the chalk line, and he held her beak down to it for just a moment, and then he slowly let go, and the chicken stood there motionless, beak to the line, hypnotized. Gordon's father was thrilled, and he said, let's do it again. So they went back to the hen house and got another chicken, and another chicken, and another chicken, until the hen house was empty, and there were 70 mesmerized white chickens with their beaks down on the front porch. Well, the boys were mesmerized, too, until the aunt and uncle showed back up from church, leading their Scotch Presbyterian pastor in his carriage, who had come to have lunch. Gordon's uncle was so furious at this public foul foolery that he drop-kicked most of the chickens off the front porch, filling the air with feathers and clucking and curses, which just so alarmed the pastor that he turned his carriage around and went back home. Now, Mackenzie's point, since this is a management book, is that we can become so mesmerized by the culture of the institution for which we work that we lose our way, and we need to remember to find our own passion. But my reason for telling the story is a little different, and before we get to it, we need to remember some things about psalms. So the first thing to remember about psalms is that they were mostly liturgy. They were preserved by the people of Israel for their use in worship. Some psalms were written from an individual's point of view and some psalms from a group's point of view, but they were saved and they were used in worship because they worked to tell the story of the people's relationship with God. They were like our hymns or like some of our prayers fixed words that people learned and could recognize and could even say together because these were words they all knew. Now, there's a problem with words that we all know. We tend to sing them or say them without thinking about what they really mean. So how often when we say the Lord's Prayer do we actually think about what those words mean? Or when we sing May the Lord be always with you. How often do we think about those words? We know the words well enough 
to sing them or say them with great accuracy while we are thinking about the dress that the woman in front of us is wearing or an out-of-season fly that's kind of buzzing under the communion table or um, where we want to go to eat or what we need to pick up from the grocery store on the way home. We stand, we sit, we even pray like chickens on a line, unhearing, unseeing, not moving, not moved, even though we are surrounded by the poetry of praise. Which brings us back to our lesson on the Psalms. Psalms are Hebrew poetry, and poetry usually loses some of its rhyme or its rhythm when it gets translated into another language. But some of the elements are usually still visible. And in Hebrew poetry, one of the elements that's visible is repetition. So you can tell what the psalmist is trying to communicate by which words are repeated. So what's repeated in Psalm 103? Well, obviously, what's repeated is the word bless. It's repeated at the beginning, it's at the end, it's all the way through the psalm. We know what we are supposed to be doing in this psalm because we are encouraged to do it so often. We are supposed to bless or praise or thank God. But what are we supposed to praise God or bless God for? What the psalm gives us is like bullet points almost. It's a list of all the things for which we bless God. God forgives us all our iniquities, our evils, our sins, our wickedness. In fact, in this psalm, there are three different words that are used for that idea of sins, which suggests that there is no kind of sin for which God does not have mercy. God heals our diseases. God rescues us from the pit, which is death or darkness or despair. God crowns us, a really good word, with steadfast, another really good word, steadfast love and mercy. In fact, the poet keeps coming back to that steadfast kind of love. In Hebrew, it's hesed. It's God's kind of love. This steadfast love is so abounding that it fills all time and space. It is as high as the heavens are high above the earth. It is as everlasting as everlasting lasts. But we're still not done. We bless God because God satisfies us with good as long as we live. So that our youth is renewed, really good thing from my point of view. God works justice for the oppressed, one of the most common themes in scripture. God has made known God's ways to Moses and to the people of Israel, of which we are a part. God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, steadfast, remember. And that's actually a quote from God's words to Moses when the people turned to the worship of a golden calf. But still, God was merciful and gracious. God does not keep anger forever. God has compassion for us, just like a parent has compassion. God remembers that we are dust, created, not everlasting. But God's love is everlasting for those who fear God which is not those who are afraid of God. It's those who honor God or those who worship or are obedient to God. So this is why we praise God, because we know that everything about us is loved by God. But we still haven't heard everything in this psalm. There's one more repetition to notice, and that's around who is supposed to praise God. Who will stand with us when we are singing this psalm? And the psalm's answer is all. All and all and all. First, all that is within me, the psalm says. Not just the bit that can say familiar words without thinking. My brain, my gut, my heart, my fears, my grief, my sorrow, my fingers, my toes, my hurt, 
my healing all find a voice in this psalm. And then not just me, but all the me's sing this psalm in the city, in the country, in Canada, in Kabul, in China, in Chechnya, in the cathedral, in the shopping mall, in the choir, in the rock band, all the me's, all the people who know God sing this psalm. And then not just all the people, but all the angels, all the mighty hosts who do God's work and whom we cannot see, and of whom we are afraid when we can see them, all of them, bless God. And finally, not even just us and them, but all of God's works, all of creation, the chickens in the hen house, the rocks splitting water as it flows downhill in streams, black holes and brown bears and geometric shapes and cast iron roses and grass growing in sand and trees shining in the moonlight. All sing God's praise. Now I will tell you that like the psalmist, I like to begin and end my sermons in the same place. I like to repeat a word or a phrase to emphasize a point. So I was tempted to end my sermon by saying that if you're going to keep your beak on a line, keep it on this one. Bless the Lord, O my soul. But I don't think that this psalm or God envisions us with our beaks to the ground, not even the ground of blessing. I think this psalm envisions us and creation lost in this joyous cacophony of holy praise. I think this psalm functions like a great drop kick to our chickenhood because we are chickens, personally and professionally mesmerized by self and success and survival. We have got our beaks down. And into this beak down life that we all share comes the word of God and the voice of God speaking in us and inviting us to join our voices and our souls and all that is in us in God's cheering and sparkling and flying and clucking and truly noisy and deeply loved creation. Can we do it? Can we make that noise. I can't speak for you. I can only remind myself and include you that all of creation is just waiting for each one of us to join in singing, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen.
people of God, will you pray with me? Let us bring the needs of the church, the world, and all in need to God's loving care. Confident in God's love and mercy, we offer our prayers to you. God, empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide, that united in your truth and love, the church may share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. God, hear the cries of the world's hungry and suffering. Give us who consume most of the earth's resources the will to reorder our lives that all may have their rightful share of the food, medical care, and shelter, and so have the necessities of a life of dignity. God, restore among us the love of the earth you created for our home. Help us put an end to ravishing its land, air, and waters, and give us respect for all your creatures, that living in harmony with everything you have made your whole creation may resound in an anthem of praise to your glorious name. God, renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on tr trust and respect. Erase prejudices that oppress. Free us from violence and give all citizens a new vision of a life of harmony. God, look with compassion on all who suffer. Support with your love those with incurable and stigmatized diseases. We pray for all who are suffering with COVID-19, those in prison, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, those who are homeless or abandoned. As you have moved toward us in love, so let us be present with them and their suffering. Sustain those among us who need your healing touch. Make the sick whole. Give hope to the dying. Comfort those who mourn. Uphold all who suffer in body or mind not only those we know and love, but also those known only to you, O God, that they may know the peace and joy of your supporting care. God, hear our prayers and help us to fulfill them, working according to your purpose in peace, justice, and mercy in all we do. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and with all God's children now and always. Amen.